welcome everybody. This is Dirty Jobs Part Four, actually, if you can believe that. Um, parts one, two, and three are are on the Seven Signal web uh, or YouTube channel. If you want to go check those out. Um, so we're gonna today we're gonna talk about uh, uh, industrial wireless security, or more to the point, uh, securing uh, an wireless at an industrial site specifically. And what's well, before I get into it, a little about me. My name is Scott McNeil. Uh, I work for Industrial Integrators Global Process Automation. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I do occasionally tweet on the X. Um, there's also you can I, I can also be found at the industrialwifishop.com, which is my blog and podcast. Uh, the Industrial Wi-Fi Shop, you can get it on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And if you want to know more about industrial integrators like the company I work for, you can check us out at global-business.net uh, global because we couldn't find a longer URL to use. So uh, like I was saying, today we're going we're gonna to discuss uh, wireless security uh, and I'll for industrial sites, but I want to kind of preface this this whole conversation with the fact that over the last uh, three or four years, uh, industry and and manufacturing in general have become uh, more and more targeted by bad actors uh, than than ever before. Uh, not just from a malware and a, a ransomware aspect <clears throat> for you know your drive bys with Sally from accounting and whatever, but to actual directed attacks with the intent to, to either destroy data or in, in the case of, of manufacturing actually cause physical damage. Because remember the logical systems at these sites have uh, direct impact in the real world. They, they, they move robotic arms, they uh, start and stop conveyors, they control cranes, they do all manner of these different things. Um, or even to extract uh, data for industrial espionage, espionage which, I never really understood in, until I moved into the industrial sector about eight years ago. Um, it, it's it's pretty intense. Uh, historically, uh, industry and manufacturing. Now, I'm not talking like all the newfangled car plants, uh, like Tesla and all that stuff, because they're all state of the art. But when you look at dirty manufacturing, and when I say dirty, I'm talking specialty chem. I'm talking uh, pulp and paper, which is where most of my background is. Uh, even some pharma and food and beverage, uh, big ag. In general, their their data systems and IT technologies run about ten years behind your standard enterprise deployment. So they're already behind the eight ball as as corporate wants more and more data from the manufacturing process, not only from a sales aspect or to see how they're doing aspect, but for preventive maintenance and how can we improve our process. How can we uh, streamline things and lower cost and increase revenue, uh, take better care of our employees? So they're already starting behind the eight ball as these things progress. And they're already behind the ball eight ball when it comes to security measures. Um, and because of this, for years, uh, as the needs for more data have increased with manufacturing sites, they have just been easy targets. Now, slowly that is starting to change, uh, especially as more and more of these events become public. It, it's really pushing people to start getting their systems more secure uh, and and insurance. And the, the cost of one of these events happening to a site is astronomical. Uh, so much so now that, that cybersecurity insurance uh, for industry and manufacturing is big, big business. And these places are starting to get audited now. They're starting to see how far behind they are from just standard security practices, right? So originally this presentation that I'm gonna go through with you guys um, was for an industrial OT security conference that I was asked to present at uh, late last year. So originally the, the audience were OT engineers and you know people from the factory floor and some corporate IT and security professionals, but they weren't necessarily uh, wireless professionals like most of us here on the webinar today. 
So some of these things that I touch on are for the majority of you like, ah, that's a no brainer or whatever. What's this guy talking about? But consider the original audience uh, who may not have the the deeper the deeper technical knowledge that most of us on on this uh, uh, call have. Additionally, when you think about a lot of the concepts that I'm going to talk about, they bleed over into other areas that we as wireless wireless professionals work in. So when you think about PCI compliance, how many of you guys have to deal with PCI compliance for card and and monetary processing, right? Um, or HIPAA for medical uh, compliance, be it online, uh, record keeping, or, or anything that has to do with patients' uh, in, uh, information, private information, or even governmental security practices where you have to deal with uh, FIPS gear and, and things of that nature, which could lead into military and whatnot. So while the focus of this is uh, an industrial site, a lot of these concepts really apply across the board uh, if you if you think about it. So I hope you guys kind of enjoy the ride. So there's three kind of whoop wrong direction. There's three kind of areas that that we're going to dig into. One is is situational awareness, and I know that's kind of ambiguous, but we'll get into that. Uh, two, understanding your current RF landscape. Eric, right? so I'm sure you guys are like, all right, well I understand that, I get that, and then finally doing the actual securing of the site's wireless assets. So these are kind of three really different categories and, and we'll, we'll just kind of dive right in. So situational awareness, what, what am I talking about when I talk about situational awareness? Well, where is your site? I know it sounds like a very simple question, but where is it? Okay. Is it, are you in a downtown area? Are you in an, an industrial park? Are you out in the woods in the middle of nowhere, as a lot of these facilities are, especially with pulp and paper? They're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and this, this becomes important as you start thinking about these other concepts that we're going to touch on. So moving that uh, one step further, what's around your site? So if you are in an urban setting or a downtown setting or uh, a suburban, you know, what's around you is it residential that's around you is it other manufacturing that's around you um the public buildings private buildings uh what what is around your site specifically and to take that yet another step further who is around your site once you kind of identified these different things now take a look at what kind of population is is around your site uh, specifically, which all of that leads to understanding what your risk is, okay? And everything as far as industrial security and OT security is all about pointing to that risk because that's what that's what your C-level people want to hear and that's what they want to understand. What is our risk, okay? Is it relatively minor? Is it low risk? Or is it substantial? Do we have a very high risk? <clears throat> So to give these, these simple questions uh, some context, I give you any paper mill USA. We'll call this uh, Acme Paper, right? Uh, home of Bugs Bunny. So here at Acme Paper, you can see this is uh, one site. And what makes uh, pulp and paper in general unique is they are actually uh, multiple different uh, so, uh, multiple different manufacturers industrial sites or manufacturing sites all in one. So while the overall goal is to make paper, when you look at it, well, there is an, and this entire section is nothing but wood processing, okay? Bringing in logs, turning it into chips, stacking these chips. So, you know, that's one whole section of the plant. Well, then there's an entire chemical process that goes along here. So now you have wood processing, you have chemical processing. Well, that's two different plants right there. Then it goes from the chemical processing into the actual uh, paper manufacturing process to churn out rolls of paper. Now, in pulp and paper, you use a ridiculous amount of water. And so on site, on most sites anyway, you have water treatment facilities. And to top it all off, they use a lot of power. So 
this site, like most uh, pulp and paper, they have their own power generation on site as well. So that's four different plants on one site, all dedicated to making paper. And that that we haven't even touched on shipping and receiving and everything else that goes along with that. And some sites actually have what are referred to as converting facilities. So you have all these other uh, plants on site, and then you have a, yet another facility that turns whatever stock it is they produce into other items. So if it's brown stock, they could have a box plant on site that's taking those giant rolls of brown stock and turning them into various cardboard boxes for various you know various other clients. So that's one of the things that makes pulp and paper in general uh, so complex and, and just interesting across the board. So where is this site? All right. When we, when we look at that first question and we look at this site, well, this, this seems kind of a, a populated area. It's not a downtown area. So what do we have going on around that site? Well, let's take a look. So when we... We look closer um, around probably half of this site are residential areas, right? So these these yellow dots are representative of the, the, the major residential areas that are very close to this plant. Uh, this area right here is actually a cemetery. And we do have a little bit of, of trees to buffer, but there are houses um, that people live in fairly close to this site. So what else do we have in here? Well, up here in the corner, this is um, a small waterway that goes to a very busy boat ramp that the entire time that I was on that, and I've been to this particular site multiple times, every time I'm there, the boat traffic in and out of the launch is constant. This right here, this body of water, this is actually the intercoastal waterway, okay? <clears throat> This particular site happens to be on a barrier island, all right? So where is our site? Our site is on a barrier island. What is around our site? Well, we've got residential, and we've got uh, an intercoastal waterway, lots of private water traffic. Then to top it off, right next door <clears throat> is a small but also very busy international port. Um, this will support two to three ships docked at a time. Uh, every time I've been on site, there have been two to three ships. And I've seen them from countries as far away as Argentina uh, to as close as Canada. So, I mean, you know, so now not only do we have a lot of private water traffic, we have a lot of international traffic on that's going right by this particular site. So we're on a barrier island. That's where we are. <clears throat> We're surrounded by um, a lot of different things going on from residential uh, to public transit to private transit um, to uh, commercial traffic. So who is it that's around? Well, that's a that's a pretty good question now, isn't it? So yes, we we have some some residents around. Um, most of the residents around this particular area, because it's a barrier island, uh, are are retirees and it's an older crowd. But with the boat launch and that port, and what you're not seeing is down the waterway a little bit, is another paper mill, okay? With a, that's a full MARSAC site, meaning that it has uh, marine security apply, uh, compliance that it has to deal with because shipping comes directly to it via the waterway as well as rail like it does here. Uh, this, this site that we're looking at, this Acme mill, is no longer a MARSAC site because they don't accept uh, uh, shipping traffic or barges anymore. Um, and then further up is a military installation, uh, a naval base. So there's a lot of complex things going on around this particular site. So again, we're back to who is around your site. We're looking at our local residents, but we're also looking at a lot of uh, people on the water, a lot of which are international people that you have no idea, okay? So to take that one step further, while I was there last time, out here in the waterway, there were several large uh, yachts. I'm talking, you know, uh, 100 feet, 150 foot uh, borderline ships, privately owned, that were docked there because they couldn't fit at the marina down the way. And they were there for several days. You have no idea 
what are on who are on these uh vessels right uh and they come and go just it's just traffic so what is your risk right you have a lot of unknowns. And so when you start calculating your risk, your risk is actually fairly moderate. It's not a low risk site. And to take, you know, as we got further into it, um, my contact with me on site, I was talking to him. I was like, you know, I'd really like to get out in that waterway and see how far your uh, wireless is pushing out in, into, the, um, into the waterway. And he was like, well, you know what? I've got a boat. So the next day, um, that that launch that's right around the corner, we went and put in his boat. And we went out into the waterway. We spent half the day. And all I did was uh, sample the, the three or four SSIDs that they were, they were pushing out. When looking at this particular uh, image, uh, sites one through five are all fairly close into shore. And while we were at those locations and I was getting uh, signal samples, I was seeing their SSIDs at uh, low 70s, low neg 70s, you know, and he was able with his, uh, his uh, cell to actually connect up, log in and get to assets on site. All right. Now, all of these locations were fairly close in, so it would be pretty obvious to security that somebody's sitting there doing something, even though it really looked like we could have been fishing. So I was like, you know what, let's move further out. Let's go out into the middle and just to, just to kind of see and, and see if, if uh, free space path loss is going to be our friend in this. And so we started moving further out uh, and, you know, at, at locations six, seven and eight, I was still seeing all their signal at high neg 70s uh, and in some cases low uh, neg 80s now while this is not necessarily usable all the time and by the way he was able to authenticate he wasn't he was having a difficult time passing traffic a lot of retransmits but he was still able to authenticate and what i had to explain to him at this point is you know in general as we all know you do not need to authenticate to capture that traffic this is wireless all we have to do is listen, okay? And if it's strong enough for me to see it and listen, I can record it and take it home and break it at my leisure. And that was kind of an eye-opener for him. He didn't realize that. Now, granted, that's something we all know, but that's not common knowledge uh, to the OT crowd, right? So it's interesting, and, and that really opened his eyes to help him understand that this is more of a risky situation than he actually thought. Now, granted, mitigation uh, for that is actually fairly simple, and that's to start, you know, cutting back your your transmit power and whatnot, so you're not pushing that far out. But even still, it's something you need to pay attention to. So, in all reality, what he thought was going to be a low risk site is actually a a, a medium, what I would consider a medium risk site, and that opened it, that opened up some eyes to to his bosses uh, during this whole process. So then we move into uh, understanding your RF landscape. And so now we're, we're getting into something a little more familiar with everybody, right? And as with anything, you know, you go through and you do your surveys, you you do spec and whatnot, and you, you need to understand what other structured wireless you have operating on your site, right? So what else is there, right? Well, you've got your 802.11 which that's what we're all normally used to dealing with. What else is there on that site that you need to understand, right? So if OT is wanting to put in their own systems, they're going to have to learn how to coexist with anything that IT already has in place. In that case, you're going to have to open that conversation with IT so you can understand what channel spaces they're using, so on and so forth, and start that coordination. But on top of that, there's all of the uh, 802.15.4 stuff, which is is very prevalent in industry in general especially with wireless heart and isa 100 you find those protocols uh probably at every site that i've been to there's very few sites that i i have been to that i have not encountered at least one of those and bluetooth everywhere you know especially ble you find that all over the place so how do we coexist with that you know how much of your your airspace is getting e eaten up by these protocols now traditionally these are all 2.4. So in this case, 
if you're trying to expand or put in a new wireless systems or or even secure current wireless systems your 2.4 may already be eaten up in which case you can't secure a system that's not stable because it's not usable what's the point and then on top of that what else is going on do you have anything proprietary are there uh laura is there is there sigfox um are there other uh access points or sensors out there that are using some sort of manufacturer proprietary stuff now this is an interesting concept that a lot of people don't think about and that is transient wireless what's coming and going on your site and this is important if you have a lot of shipping and receiving of any fashion so one thing that we're all used to right is is hotspots right now thanks to uh entities like uh what was it marriott you know uh you can't who I, <laughs> marriott they actually got caught what was it 2014 2015 um specifically uh, attacking people's wireless hotspots in their hotel conferences conference centers because they wanted people to use their pay to play uh and they got uh, uh fined by the FCC to the tune of like five hundred six hundred thousand dollars at several sites who were participating in this so there's no because it's it's um it's the ISM bands you know they're these they're free for everybody to use they're open for everyone to use you're not allowed to block or jam or attack them like that for those reasons so on an industrial site you can't control whether they come and go unless you have a policy right that's the only way that you can attack that you know thou shalt not use mobile hotspots while on site and and you can enforce that with uh policy so if you get caught doing it you can be escorted off site if you're an employee uh and you get caught doing it you could be fined there's a number of different ways around that but you know physically you cannot do anything to deter uh, the broadcast of, of hotspots. But on top of that is something that I didn't really um, knew existed until I got into the industrial sector and started seeing it myself is transportation fleet management. And this is uh, trucks, this is trains, um, more so on trucks. And one of the ones I see commonly are called uh, PNET. It's like PNET and then would be uh, followed up by a string of numbers. And what that's short for is PeopleNet. And that apparently is one of the largest uh, transportation fleet management systems out there that can be purchased. But then you have all your independents as well. And they'll just have a, a, a hotspot running either off their phone or through a device actually mounted on their truck. Now for fleet management, it's usually a module on top of the truck that is uh, connected via SAT or uh, cellular so that it can feedback diagnostics and different things like that to the uh, to the fleet company. And then many times it'll also also broadcast Wi-Fi for various devices in the truck and for the driver. But these are things that you have to take into consideration because they are coming and going. They are not a constant. Some days there's more, some days there's less. And many times they're moving through the site. So to really understand your RF landscape, you have to be aware that these guys are there. There's not necessarily a whole lot you can do about it, but at least once you have that knowledge, you can plan around it. And then, you know, um, EMI, RFI, what frequencies do they affect? This, this, is, this leads into some of my favorite stuff because I'm a, I'm a spec and junkie. Uh, I do love me some spectrum analysis. And getting those samples out there is very important. Because again, how can you secure something if something is not stable and usable to begin with? And you know, if if and you guys have, have looked at any of my stuff before, some of these will look familiar because I've used them before. But in this case, this was interference in uh, 900 megahertz systems. So uh, it Ray was raising the, the noise floor probably 30, 40 percent on some uh, low power uh, transmit 900 megahertz that was around. This, this could interfere with that significantly. In this case, it, uh, we were, were looking at a giant microwave dryer whose shielding was incomplete. Um, the, the machine in question was, was really big, to be honest with you. And the area that was lacking shield, shielding was only two feet by two feet. And it was pushing out this much interference in 2.4. So much so that when you look down here at the bottom, 
this right here was all of the access points trying to auto adjust down to one so that they could eat, at least operate in that frequency. But even then they started stepping on themselves and started eating up all the airtime down in, in channel one. And then finally, another site that I was at, this was an infrared curing machine and it was just annihilating uh, 2.4 just in general. And to be honest with you, it's a nice kind of cool looking sine wave. And it was actually pushing down to 2.3 and end up into 2.5 as well. So it was uh, it was crushing a lot of uh, uh, usable frequency. And the funny thing is, even though the guys there on site didn't know it, when I dug into that machine and started reading the uh, the documentation on the machine, it actually stated in the machine that it generated, or in the documentation that it generated uh, interference in, in those frequencies. So, you know, if you read your documentation, that stuff can really help you out. So what is your risk, right? Well, what is your risk is stability. Um, if you do not have a stable uh, uh, wireless network, how are you going to have a secure wireless network if it's not even usable? So, you know, your, your risk is pretty big there. Um, let alone the fact, how far are you pushing out offsite like we were talking about earlier? So these these are things you need to understand in order to you to better um, help you understand what's going on, <clears throat> so that uh, the property proper security methods can be put in place. All right, now this is the stuff you guys are gonna um, you guys probably already know for the most part, but eight hundred two point eleven security. Um, I know this goes without saying with this crowd, but WEP and WPA, you know. If you're using those, you you need to you you should probably be fired. You need to go get a new job. You know, don't stick around. Uh, WPA two, uh, which is the flavor that most people are on right now, just in general, because not everybody has uh, transitioned to Wi-Fi six, where WPA three is mandatory, um, and whatnot. But you know, there are still things that you can do with WPA two to take your security a little step further. Now, this is, again, more geared towards the industrial side of things because APs are different. Um, you don't find your mass controllers for industrial radios like you do in the private sector. So you don't have your Cisco Wireline controllers. You don't have your Aruba controllers. Uh, you don't have your uh, Meraki and Ruckus cloud controllers. That That's not a thing. Most industrial radios you are configuring individually or they may have a small software suite that you run locally that is capable of configuring multiple radios at a time. Um, but then you need to look at your devices that are connecting up. And this goes back to what I was talking about in general, how industry tends to run about 10 years behind the technology of everybody else. There's a lot of legacy devices. But one of the things you can do to help shore up uh, and modernize your security of WPA2 is the farthest you've gotten is engage with 802.11w, management frame protection, right? In many cases, when it comes to wireless deployments in industrial, it's it's industrial AP to uh, industrial AP. Okay, it's not your laptop, it's not um, it's not your phone, it's not uh, a tablet. You are connecting machine to machine communication, in which case you can protect those management frames, which is you know the number one thing that you look for when you're trying to hack a signal. Because 802.11w, that immediately protects you from replay attacks, uh, man in the middle, and various other things, because all of that important information and, and that first connection frame is all encrypted. So that, that's a huge deal. And if you can just take that one step right there, you have really helped mitigate a lot of different things right off the bat. <clears throat> Otherwise, if you can uh, migrate to WPA3, if your devices are WPA3 capable, Absolutely, because uh, management payment protection is mandatory. It has more advanced and stronger encryption values and types. And it addresses all those other base vulnerabilities that WPA2 has uh, has from the standard and corrects them. So uh, I don't, I'm sure I don't really need to get any further into that. You guys, uh, as a the wireless community, understand that. And there has been, I mean, when you look at stuff by like JJ and, and some of these other people, I don't need to get in all that super depth in depth with all that stuff with you guys. Um, but 802.15 security is a little different, right? So we're when we're looking at that and and 
many of these are, are straight industrial protocols. Their security is, is a little bit different. Um, you don't have your WPA, WPA2, WPA3. You don't have all of that, right? So when we look at our, our uh, the capabilities of our different wireless types, you know, there's a lot going on here. And specifically, when we look at our 802.15.4, um, your six low pan, your Bluetooth, wireless heart, ZBZ wave, you know, by IEEE um, standards, you know, thou shalt have AES 128 bit encryption. So there is encryption built in. However, that's kind of where it ends. That's really the only thing uh, in the grand scheme of things that the standards specify. But when you look at the different flavors of, of the protocols that are based upon 802.15.4, they almost always add additional uh, security steps. So this is just kind of some examples I threw together, um, six low pan um, using uh, TLS and DTLS for some upstream communication, pass keys for Bluetooth LE, um, wireless heart. I have some of these things listed, but there are a lot of different actual steps that uh, in wireless heart that um, you can actually include to help secure that even further. But with wireless heart and ISA 100, you're not going to be able to connect up your laptop and, and see these guys. You know, it's a whole different protocol. None of the, it's not 802.11. So this is not what you're going to see. The only way to really see these things is to either have an 802.15.4 device that can connect to it or through spectrum analysis. So really, uh, if someone is trying to do a, a man in the middle attack on you with, with these things, they've already done a lot of work. They've gotten a device type um, and now they're just trying to uh, figure out how to get it connected to your network. But there's a lot of different ways that these particular protocols um, use to protect that onboarding process. So it's very, very difficult for someone to inject into one of these mesh networks or whatever the uh, topology may be. Then you have all of your proprietary stuff. And there in, in the industrial universe, there is a lot of proprietary protocols. Just some examples, um, Cisco Curb used to be known as Fluid Mesh. Um, all of their stuff is all proprietary. You can't see it with a laptop, you can't do that. They do offer a, a tool that you can download, um, well, that you have to pay for, but it's Cisco, so there's gonna be a license for it. Um, and you know you can view it that way, or you can just look at what it's doing in spec and. But it's it's one of those things a little harder to get uh, PCAPs on unless you have uh, their software that that uh, they can set to you. Phoenix Contact Banner. These guys do a lot of wireless I/O input output. They do a lot of sensors. Um, they're on 900 megahertz, so it's an entire different frequency base. You know, it's the the 902 to 928 ISM band. And they're on frequency hopping, right? So, you know, it's going to be difficult to get um, any sort of in between these guys from the get-go. Um, now, with Phoenix Contact, I, I know from experience, even though they're not 802.15.4, they do 128-bit uh, encryption. Uh, but it's also, you know, device-specific and device-centric. So if you're not another Phoenix device, it's not going to accept you uh, uh, into the fold, so to speak, on its connections. Um, and they have a few other steps for onboarding that help protect that whole process. Banner is pretty interesting because, you know, they they do all that, um, but they don't encrypt their traffic. It's it's all plain text. But even then, you're going to have to have a device that understands their uh, proprietary protocol to even understand it. And then when I was talking to one of the Banner guys, he told me straight up, he was like, you know, yeah, it's plain text, but the the data that's being passed forth, because you got to remember, these are also uh, low data rate stuff. These are 128K uh, long distance um, communications. So the data that you're going to get is a small string of numbers that has absolutely zero context to anything but other banner sensors. So even if you are capable of getting that traffic, it's it's useless to you because there's no context to the data that, it, that it's pulling out. Um, esteem, esteem is an interesting case. They both do uh, proprietary. Well, they're proprietary, um, but they both do larger data streams as well as um, uh, mesh networks and whatnot. 
but they base their their wireless on MPLS, and it's interesting how they set it all up. And they do use some um, other standards like spanning tree and whatnot, uh, but the actual wireless protocol is is something that they've modified enough to where it became proprietary, and it's not something you're going to see with a standard Wi-Fi scanner and whatnot. So there's a lot of uh, additional security processes built into these different wireless types. Um, and, you know, I hate to even use the phrase security through obscurity, but in essence, this is the one place where it really kind of holds true, because if you can't see it, touch it, feel it, taste it, and even then, like in the case with Banner, if you were able to get a sample of that data, doesn't mean anything. There's zero context to it. So there's a lot of different things involved to help secure these types of assets. Management access. Now, again, this is more of a, an industrial point of view because many of uh, the majority of these APs are all uh, configured individually as opposed to in mass, and you're not talking about uh, controllers. So when when we're talking about management access, you want to disable OTA management um, on any of your industrial radios, just in general, if they're 802.11. If they are not, then, you know, if they are a mesh setup, uh, if they're 802.15.4, if they are proprietary, disabling OTA uh, is not really an option in some of these because that's how they manage other devices in their mesh networks. <clears throat> but if it's 802.11, I would definitely uh, disable the OTA uh, management capabilities. As far as interfaces, only allow HTTPS, SSH access to these devices. You don't want plain text uh, uh, traffic going, configuration traffic going across the network. That, that kind of applies to everything in general, um, including route switch firewall. And, you know, I'm all about segmenting traffic. That's a big part of everything. And make sure, so just segment off your management traffic on a completely different VLAN whenever possible. Our key takeaways to this entire thing, right? You know, we, we touched on a lot of different things, but owning your industrial airspace is a whole lot more than just encrypting traffic. There is a lot more to it. There's a lot more things that you need to be aware of. You have to look at the site holistically. You, you need to understand everything that's going on um, in and around your site to really understand your overall risk. Um, for various types uh, of, of issues that can arise. And, and finally, and I preach this to the moon and back to everybody I meet, you do not have the luxury of deciding whether you are a target or not. That is not up to you. You do not get to make that decision. So you have to be as vigilant as you, uh, absolutely, as, as vigilant as you can just in general. And that is it for the Scott show today. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. And we do have some questions in the Q&A panel for you. So let me get those pulled up for you. Um, oh, am I going to butcher the name right away? OK, here I go. Waldock? Waldock, I think. Um, I got a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, first one here is why are these specific industries traditionally slow with implementing new technology? Well, there's that, that's a great question. And there, there's a couple of reasons that kind of lead to that. One is, is money. A lot of these manufacturing sites um, are old. They've been around and they're very, very lean and they don't have a lot of uh, extra budget to screw around with, you know, two, much of this is what is referred to as process manufacturing, which means it's continual, okay? It's not stop and go. It's just constant, all right? And if they are not running, they are not making money. Any sort of downtime for whatever the case may be uh, costs a lot of money, okay? Mm -hmm. And so in that, when you start implementing all these data systems, many sites don't see the ROI on these data systems because these systems that are put in do not make money for the site. And that's all that they're concentrating on, okay? Is this going to give me a monetary return on my site? Well, no. And that's kind of an issue with IT in general, right? Your data infrastructure, that doesn't make money for whatever company it is that you work for. 
But when you're already a very lean manufacturing center that has to be running constantly, um, that that makes a big difference, let alone the fact the time it takes to implement a lot of this stuff. So typically, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll go to pulp and paper as an example, you, you have scheduled outages uh, specifically they have like, in general, they have uh, like a big one once a year. And that outage may be a week, maybe two weeks, but that's your window to either implement new systems or update current systems and things of that nature. That's all the time you've got because you can't, unlike IT, you can't go in and add things on, on the run because it might affect the process. Um, you can't go in and reboot APs, switches, route, firewall, whenever you want, because it may affect the process. And in some of these cases, if you affect the process and it doesn't shut down properly, um, especially when you're dealing with chemical sites and things like that, I mean, that can make things go boom. If the safety systems don't have the chance to uh, communicate and shut things down in a proper fashion, you could cause environmental issues. Uh, like if you have a ClO2 dump, you know, that that's chlorinous gas. Um, that can cause loss of life. Uh, then that that also causes uh, company uh, damages to the company's um, uh, uh, oh my gosh their the reputation which can then in turn lead to uh, stock losses and other monetary losses so all these things are kind of all tied together which makes them slow to adopt any new things so between money and time frames those are kind of the two biggest things and in general. It takes a concerted effort of a lot of people pushing uh, to get new technology in. So I hope that kind of answers your your question. Yeah, that's a great response. Also, I just got to make sure you hear the shout outs that are coming through in the chat. They love the presentation. So oh, sure yay. <laughs> give you flowers. <laughs> oh, very important question. What is the light to, I guess it'd be your right, our left. You got to show them the, the Death Star. Oh. <laughs> so for Star Wars fans, that is the second Death Star that is under construction, complete with blinky lights. <laughs> it's over my workbench. It's awesome. Scott has the coolest office you've ever I'm, seen. I'm a bit of a Star Wars junkie. So there's, <laughs> uh, and and I'm, I'm team dark side. So, you know, there's, there's Vader and stormtroopers all over my office. Love it. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled Q&A. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so we got another one that came through during like the use case. So were signals measured out to the residential properties that are very close to the plant with some that can potentially be Airbnb? Yes, um, I didn't dig into that just because we were roaming around on a golf cart and some people kind of were looking at us relatively strangely. But um, the signals were very, very faint at that point. When I say very, very faint, I was seeing them at high um, neg nine, mid to high neg nineties. So uh, because there was a fair amount of tree barrier to go through, um, that gosh, this was a while ago now. Um, and even when I tried to grab a, a PCAP off some of that, there were so many retransmits, I wasn't able to really kind of pull useful data at that point. Gotcha. All right. And then one more here. Are mesh capable hardened APs used in the industrial industry where some are compatible with WLCs for central management? Uh, yeah, actually, Siemens has an entire line um, and, and they have uh, a central control capability. Um, and then Cisco is is. They have a whole series of industrial hardened uh, APs that are Wyland controller compliant. But again, that's for standard 802.11 stuff. Um, you typically don't see that for, well, I haven't seen it at all for 802.15.4 stuff because that, that, that's a whole different universe. Uh, anybody who has uh, worked or gone the, um, worked through the, uh, the IOT track for the CWNP stuff, that really kind of introduces you uh, to how all that stuff operates. And it's really interesting um, on how all that goes because while they do have central management capabilities, it's not wireless controllers per se. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, all right, we've got one. Scott, can you please explain 
how does management VLAN help with security? How can we configure controlled access that was mentioned? Okay. Uh, by, by trade, uh, I'm an industrial and security architect. Okay. Uh, industrial and network and security architect. Uh, VLAN segmentation is one of your base building blocks of network security, period. All right. It's not only about segmenting your broadcast domains uh, internally with your traffic. It's about controlling that traffic and who can access that traffic. So it, it involves firewall controls. And if you use core switches for routing, it involves uh, inner VLAN routing controls and things of that nature. So that is just another step of your uh, defense and depth strategies for controlling who can access uh, your radios, right? Um, that, like I said, that that's that's base security. That's security 101 is network segmentation. Yeah. All right, and Matt, I think, oh, one just came through. This will be our last one, guys. Um, so uh, what can you say about the security of captive portals? Always a fan favorite. <laughs> even, if, <laughs> even if authentication is done by various methods, traffic can still be captured and decoded. Um, so many people use captive portals. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of them in general, just because of how long it, especially with Pulp and Paper is notorious for using terrible captive portals. So, I mean, especially for their guest access and it's all unencrypted, it's all open. Um, so, but as far as getting deep in, in, into the, the captive portal, uh, I'm probably not the best person to really kind of dig into that. Um, but I know I don't care for them. I don't view them as the most secure method of authentication and connection. And if I had my way, they wouldn't be used at all. Because um, in the end, it's all about that user experience, right? And if you have a terrible user experience, everyone's going to hate the wireless, right? Um, and if you have a terrible user ex experience combined with a not very secure way to authenticate in general, um, then that's that's two strikes against you right there. And no one's even going to like what you're doing. And you're going to have a hard time finding funding in the industrial universe. Yeah. Kind of a common theme there. Everything comes back around to budgetary numbers. Yep. All right. Okay. I promised I was a liar before. This is really the last one, but it, <laughs> it just came through. And I think it'd be, it'd be helpful. Um, it's someone just asking, first of all, thank you for the awesome presentation, but a few resources you would suggest for looking into wireless network automation and uh, for automation engineer roles. Um, for automation engineer roles, there are, gosh, um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not an automation engineer per se. So I, I do um, uh, network and wireless uh, communications for industrial sites. So uh, you leave the carpeted space. That's where I do all my networky, fun networky stuff and security stuff. Uh, automation engineers, that's kind of a different story. There are tons of resources out there. Um, I would start by looking at a lot of the free resources that are put out there by the big companies like Rockwell, Siemens, Honeywell, AVB. There's a ton of free content out there by those guys. Uh, as far as resources for industrial wireless, well, that's kind of why I've been starting to do what I've been doing with my blog and my podcast, because there are not a lot of resources out there specifically for industrial wireless and industrial wireless applications other than what the vendors themselves put out. Um, so in which case, you know, that's always going to be skewed by someone's agenda. They're always going to be uh, downplaying others and, and pointing back to themselves. So, um, you know, I just started my podcast, The Industrial Wi-Fi Shop. You can find me at my website or on um, Spotify or Apple Podcast. You know, we, we talk about a lot of the stuff in there. There are a few of us out there. And as more industrial wireless guys like me hear about it, and they, they, they've been reaching out, which has been awesome. And so we're, we're starting to build that side of the community. Um, you know, I wish there were more resources out there. I will say there are a few vendors that have um, a lot of just good resources in general, if not people. Uh, Phoenix Contact, as far as uh, industrial wireless, they have uh, some great people and some great content um, to help you understand different things. Uh, ProSoft has some uh, great content. Um, 
uh, banner engineering for wireless sensors uh, and esteem. These guys, you know, that I threw up earlier, they have a lot of solid content about their own products and whatnot, but there really is not a lot out there for vendor neutral um, resources. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm really trying to start, you know, building. And I'm very, very fortunate that I work for the company that I do uh, because they allow me the freedom to do this as long as I keep my other projects rolling. Um, and, you know, and for those who are, you know, the, the guy was asking about, you know, you know, careers in, in automation, uh, if you're looking for a career in automation, because you've been studying that direction, you know, Hey, check out our website. We've always got openings for automation engineers. There's a lot of integrators out there. That's awesome. And of course I do have to first, um, I'm glad you were able to plug your podcast and we'll follow up tomorrow and put all the information so you can go follow Scott um, and get those resources. And also I have to shamelessly plug Seven Signal. And I think a reason that I really like working for this company is because like these webinars are neutral. We like, that's the whole thing is that we wanted to build like a Wi-Fi community and, and you're all part of that. So obviously got to plug a little bit our webinars so oh, totally. uh, <laughs> well i mean honestly with this webinar series that was a big part of pulling me into the wireless community as a whole um awesome. and i see i got the questions pulled up and and someone's asking me about discord or slack communities what's funny is oh yeah really i i hang out all the time on uh the clear to send slack because uh roel and um uh and francois are awesome guys and i've, I've gotten to hang out with them a little bit and so I'm, I'm on their Slack all the time. I recently got on the CWMP Slack. Um, and then, you know, and then I've got my podcast that I build. I'm on episode five. Awesome. I've gotten some good Woo. feedback. Woo. Five, five. Eight, five episodes. Um, <laughs> um, and then, you know, then there's the, the new community that's being built up, Wyco. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. Um, but they're they're doing smaller wireless events all over the world. You know, over in Europe, there there's uh, Ali has been um, putting together some here in the states. Matter of fact, there's going to be one in uh, Chapel Hill area, North Carolina, uh, mm -hmm. on June twelfth. I will actually be doing um, a two hour uh, wireless industrial wireless radio lab um, that that everybody can participate in with configuring uh, and getting. Uh, industrial radios to talk to one another. Um, yeah, you can just hit up Wyco. I think it's Wyco.org um, and and check that out because that's another way to start, you know, getting involved out there. Um, I'm really excited for this one. I've got my radios. I've been getting all my extra. I bought a, a bunch of extra little tiny screwdrivers because if you're part of this lab, you're going to be able to learn how to hardwire an industrial radio to a 24 volt DC power supply. Um, uh, and, you know, configure everything up. It, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. 